let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Kurt Dukach. Uh, today I have Michael McCullough, Perry Haichu, and our guest, the Mayor Pro Tem, Steve Ross, in the house. So, um, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Las Vegas. City of Las Vegas, yes, that's Indeed. right. Indeed. And, and we're happy to have you here, uh, Steve. Um, you know, and let's get right into it. Um, I know you're, you're a native Nevadan. Um, so I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, for you growing up uh, up north and, and coming down here, um, what did you do before you got involved in public service and what got you interested in the political game? Well, I'm a union electrician by trade, so I'm in construction all my life pretty mm -hmm. much. And uh, uh, my wife, I met my wife at Twin Lakes Elementary School in the third grade. We have five children. Wow. We have 14 grandchildren, all under the age of eight years old, living within a mile of my house. So <laughs> they all stay. Great. And uh, just very fortunate to want to give back and had an opportunity in 2004 when Michael Mack uh, chose not to run for re-election uh, to, to do so. I was going to planning on running for county commission the year before that, but, but my wife's business was growing so quickly and we were so busy, I just did not have the time. So um, that's kind of who I am, and uh, the opportunity to, 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 to run for that office was significant, perfect timing, actually. Uh, I did run against 13 other people in the primary and then uh, a runoff in the general election, which I won... Uh, handily and have won my re-elections ever since then. I got recalled once, if you recall, mm -hmm. um, which was an interesting go go around. Uh, did run for mayor against Carolyn Goodman uh, when she jumped in the race. I was far, certainly far too deep to get out, mm -hmm. but uh, that was a good op uh, a good education for me. I, I'm, I don't regret doing that at all. Gave me an opportunity to meet some new people, and that's part of campaigning. That's part of actually being in this office or any elected office. You get to meet great people who continue and want to serve this community. You get to you, you meet a few honorary ones too down the road. But uh, for the most part, they're good people trying to do good things. And speaking of meeting, I, I remember meeting you uh, at a breakfast with the mayor up in Summerlin back in 2010, shortly after the federal raids when we had that, that green summer and the dispensaries were first happening and just trying to get the, the laws to change. And I remember um, Oscar had told you uh, that this is a... a um, a constituency that is uh, legitimate and respectable and I found you um, open from the first on this uh, and it is an important issue to many people and through the City Council as we can board members have uh, have testified over the past couple of years as, as we're birthing this new industry uh, we've we've seen you be a friend to the industry and, and what are your feelings on on medical marijuana well in it, I think in general I, it's interesting growing up in the time period that I we, we grew up mm -hmm. in uh, and all of a sudden now it's legalized in many states for recreational use as well it's kind of interesting to just be in this be here at this time in in, in life I guess because um, it was so taboo for so many years and, and, and it still is to a lot of people but I did not realize the medical benefits of the the, the, the cannabinoids uh, in medical marijuana I had no idea and uh, felt uh, very much like a lot of people who were totally against it at one point but then all of a sudden it's really helping patients mm -hmm. you know this is something that we really need to research I mean growing up here in Las Vegas you're exposed to, to drugs and marijuana at an early age uh, and just by going to school here but there is real real potential for medical marijuana to make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives Absolutely. and I really want to see that research I really want to see that take place um, I think it was Sanjay Gupta um, well, on CNN, it was, mm -hmm. was did a show many years ago, and he was that same mindset. Oh no, it's bad. You know, marijuana will never be in the mainstream. And then he saw what happened to a little girl. I think it was Charlotte, and that's mm -hmm. where the term Charlotte's Web comes from, uh, for that strain of marijuana and how it changed her life. And I watched that show. And oh, going from multiple seizures oh, a day down sakes. to just, you know, a few in a week. Well, being a parent and watching my daughter go through that and there's nothing I can do and the medical doctors are telling me there's nothing they can do. And then all of a sudden, here comes this medical marijuana breakthrough and, and, and it works. Um, uh, cancer victims, um, mm -hmm. PTSD folks that are going through the PTSD issues. I mean, all of the wondrous benefits of marijuana that we don't even know yet. I, I really think that if if cannabis didn't get you high it would be considered a miracle plant in so many ways but that euphoria that it has given has given rise to this stigma over the past 70 plus years and uh, it has just uh, turned from uh, a plant which has been helping people for millennia uh, into this this devil weed and that, that's not because <laughs> the plant changed it's because uh, societal not even societal norms but certain people who had things to gain by prohibition 
people just, believe what they're told to believe. And yeah. it was even more true back then when there were so fewer media sources and so fewer uh, avenues of information like the mm -hmm. information uh, you know the age of information is upon us we have the infinite power of the internet in our hands and back then it was much more controlled and i'm not exactly sure how many people were even literate back then during the great depression and things like that like those were kind of weird times when they passed mm -hmm. all those anti-cannabis laws so well remember too the the coca plant the, the coca plant used to be in coca-cola i mean it used to be in many I, products yes. uh, er, er, early on and until you know the the dangers of that were certainly found out and and mm -hmm. then it was taken out of, out of the sure. mainstream but um, i think it's minds minds are changing and yet it's interesting because uh, the coca plant cocaine is a schedule 2 drug under the federal government mean, meaning that doctors could prescribe it and i recall when i was living in new york that there was a uh, that there was a dentist who was doing cocaine nasal swabs to clean out people's knows and you know that's that was that was a little strange to, <laughs> to, to hear about but the idea is that that cocaine is scheduled too and, and allowed to be prescribed by doctors and cannabis is still scheduled well let's talk about that for a minute I think um, I think uh, hopefully the, our president before he leaves office will uh, exercise one of his uh, executive orders and and change that because what does that say about us as, as, as a society in regards to trying to help patients with some challenging, challenging issues? We've got the medicine available. Let's use the medicine available and make these people better. Yeah. Now, reschedule it and make it researchable. I mean, because even if you're against cannabis, we need to see this research. I mean, if, if you believe it doesn't help, you should be for this research. Prove it. Let, let the science show that. You know what I mean? I think we're going to see that even if this if it doesn't get the scheduled the schedule change I honestly believe that because I believe the researchers right now are watching this movement throughout the country on the medical stuff and and the recreational stuff is a whole different topic of discussion I think because if I want to get high I want to get high right but if I need my medication because my bones hurt mm -hmm. or I'm going through chemotherapy totally different discussion correct so I think we're gonna see that research regardless if they when they change the schedule or not because the people want to know Mm -hmm. And I think professionals in the industry, and you guys are doing a great job by talking about it and promoting it and it helping people understand it better. You know, when I, I had met Oscar Goodman back in 2002, and in one of our early discussions, he, he told me, you can't legislate morality. And of course, Oscar was for legalizing everything and, <laughs> and you know, including prostitution yeah, along the <laughs> Fremont East and all that. And, and, but, but he was right in the point. You, people are going to do what they want to do. And, and that does not extend to, to violence or anything like that. But, but as far as, uh, as something like cannabis, uh, if they're going to use it, and half the people in America have, uh, isn't it better to tax it and regulate it and get public benefit out of it as opposed to just turning it over to criminals. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And we all know what happened during prohibition times. Uh, mm -hmm. We got NASCAR out of that, which I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we also had the rise of the mafia. We did, we did. I'm, so, I'm just joking, but but I think I think a lot of people's minds are changing and uh, they, they have to. It's, uh, it's, like I said, it's an interesting time we live in. It's so exciting. Uh, this coming about, there are so many other things coming about that are going to be in our time period that we, we didn't see 10, 20 years ago. So the next five to 10 years, we're going to see great, great research done. Uh, what strains do what and how to, how to get help your migraine the best. And, uh, and I think people are going to start changing their attitude towards it, honestly. I, I've got to say, for, um, for someone involved in politics, you're extraordinarily well informed on this. No subject. doubt. <laughs> and, Absolutely. And, yes, sir. Yeah, and, and that's a breath of fresh air. Well, really. I think he's so, much more informed than his, uh, his competitor that you're running against in, in the county commission yeah, race. You know, she, she, she's been <laughs> very prohibitive in our, in our discussion. She did us no favors in, in legislature last, last time around. And I was a little bit surprised, actually. I hate to be so, so political, but it seems like the Democrats are more on our side than the Republicans on this case. And she seemed to be a voice against. And I, I, uh, don't really want to go into why, but I'm just grateful to have your support on this. And well, you bet. Well, she carried a lot of the Republicans' water for him in the last legislative session. So mm -hmm. there's that's that's in, on in record multiple ways, yeah. in multiple ways. Uh, you know, so it's it, unfortunate. That's an unfortunate thing. But let's talk about that for a minute, because I, okay. when we first, the legislature should have handled all of this, this whole licensing issue, this whole categorizing issue, all of the things that local governments had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the city of Las Vegas has been very difficult. And, and it's funny when I knew the legislature was going to shove this down to local governments, I told our staff at the city, get over with Clark County, get with the city. Henderson in North Las Vegas let's have a blanket set of of, of, of standards for the for the for the dispensaries for the 
production, for the uh, cultivation. So it's blanket across the valley. For, for too long, our governments have lived in silos. And you know what the response was from our city team after weeks of me asking and prodding them? The county says, go pound sand, we're going to do our own. So the county sets their certain standards. We set our standards. And now we're having to change those so it's fair competitively mm -hmm. uh, for, between the city and the county. So fortunately, we have a very good relationship with North Las Vegas uh, as a city of Las Vegas because that's my biggest border, North Las Vegas. And uh, the city of Henderson, uh, they're doing their own thing because they're, they're, they're next to the county. But nonetheless, I think the legislature shoved it down the throats of local governments purposely uh, purposely instead of dealing with, with themselves like they should have I think this should have been handled at the state level they should have set the parameters all of the licenses should have gone through the state and not the local governments well I think I, one of the I largely agree with you but I think one of the issues was that the state government did not want to um, occupy the field and take over local land use and zoning regulations and and that is at least the reason reason that they gave for tossing so much of it to local governments. <laughs> How many times have you seen the legislature in this state hand things down to local governments because they didn't want to deal with it? Too many times, time and time again. Or they'll form a committee or a group of people to, let's study that because we don't want to make the t difficult decisions. I'm going to tell you something. You run for office. You want to serve the public. You're elected to make difficult decisions based on what you think is best for your community. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me when people run for those offices and they don't stand up and do what their jobs are supposed to do. I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, and not not to defend them, but you, we have a part-time legislature that meets for 120 days every other year, but our local governments are full-time governments, and so are more responsible to oh, the absolutely. people. Oh, absolutely, and well, I, th I think you guys have seen me, uh, how I've served the city. I'm there every single day. Uh, my team is out there in the field, even on weekends and their days off. I mean, and it's I hate to say that, but we're 24-7, just like the city is. Yep. Yes, sir. Do you believe that a more full-time. I've asked our last uh, guest last week about this, and I'll ask you the same thing. Do you believe that the state would be well served or less served by having a at least an annual legislative session rather than a biannual or extending that legislative session? Do you feel like they're put under too much pressure to get all of two years of work done in the 120-day session, or do you just think that's nonsense and they could they could do it and they purposefully just kind of shoo away the things they don't want to under the guise of not having the time? I think it's a game. I honestly do. I don't think that the state could be served. If they met uh, annually, I think what would be better is if the legislature actually gave some functional home rule to cities and counties to allow them them to make decisions so the cities and the counties didn't have to wait every two years for the legislature <laughs> to give them an opportunity to do something. Um, and I'm not talking about taxing authority. I'm not talking about fee authority. We already have that. I'm talking about just functional things that our local governments uh, want to do and they can't because they're, they're bound by the legislative process. I served two years as the president of the Nevada League of Cities, which gave me an opportunity to associate with a lot of the mayors, uh, a lot of the council members throughout the state, certainly the five cities in southern Nevada. And, you know, we have a lot of similar issues going on and we're, we're, we're almost handcuffed sometimes when it comes to just functional realities of being local governments and serving our constituencies better. Let, let me wow. go back to, to one thing that you said just a little earlier uh, about more research. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about um, a medical school coming down to Las Vegas based, you know, a, a UNR based medical school that, that would is operating or will be operating out of uh, uh, UNLV or, or they're using that as the foundation and my question is if we get that medical school uh, yes I agree with you that it would be great to turn Las Vegas into a center of research in this area is this something that the county commission that you're running for will have any sort of pull in you know I think that the more local leaders who understand the where we lack in educational mm -hmm. resources in Southern Nevada. I get it because I've spent a great deal of time with Professor Rob Lang mm -hmm. from the Brookings Institute uh, at UNLV. Uh, he's certainly given me, gives me an education every time I meet with him actually, but uh, uh, we need a research facility, we need a research university here in Nevada and in Las Vegas, not, not Northern Nevada, Southern Nevada. There's yes. two million people that live here in, in the South and a million that live in the North, so it's three million population. This is the epicenter of uh, economic growth, economic development. Sure, they've got Tesla going on up there, and I know Switch is looking at a new co-location up there as well. But this is where the people are. This is where the tax g revenue mm -hmm. generation is, is really is, right here in Southern Nevada. Sure. And according to Professor Lang, we've got to have a, a, a research university, a medical school, our own. And I think that's significant. I know UNLV wants that. And I think as a county commissioner, we can always be talking about ringing that bell and always trying to push the, the, the bar a little farther to make it a reality. So 
Uh, Lynn Jessup over you know, be good leadership going on over there right now. But uh, I think all local governments need to be on board on a regional level when it comes to these things. Is it a is it a research university? Is it a, a medical is it a medical school? Is it like is it light rail down Maryland Parkway for transportation? Is it a dome stadium or you know mm -hmm. where does it go? I think all of these are regional issues that everybody needs to be on board with and not be living in their silos, which they do today. Well, to stop passing the joint for a minute, let, let me ask you <laughs> like what what else what else are your core issues as you're running for the county commission? Well, I got to tell you, the, the, the initial core issue is the relationships. Um, the uh, the the relationships are very strained right now between the county and the municipalities mm -hmm. uh, and that needs to be fixed I think the county needs to be that umbrella government that looks at the municipalities within its borders and says how can I help you not how can I hurt you mm -hmm. how can I help you and not be the gorilla in the room and I think that's what's been going on uh, as of late I think uh, Mayor Goodman's trying to be, has been doing a very good job representing the city as a whole um, I think that uh, the current county commission lacks in a lot of leadership uh, opportunities. I think the economic opportunities th there as well. The city of Las Vegas has got the most robust economic development department, I think, in the, in, in the country, one of the best. And the county has nothing, and there's so many great opportunities that the county could be looking for just for economic growth and development. Let's use cultivation, for example. Well, let, let me back up a little bit. The city is actually focused on sectors, and we looked at East Fremont Street years ago and said, what do we want to see on East Fremont? We want to bring downtown back. What are we missing? Well, we did away with the, the licensing fee for, for a liquor license for you to have a tavern. So what did that do? Both, a whole bunch of taverns popped up on East Fremont Street. So we focused in on an industry. We brought them down there. We helped them get started, and now it's alive and well in downtown Las Vegas. And that's the, the heart of our city. The county can do the same thing in focusing on certain businesses, certain uh, industries that we currently don't have, and say, okay, how do we really sweeten the, sweeten the pie here to make, make these folks want to come to, to Clark County in Southern Nevada? That's not happening. Mm -hmm. And that needs to. And, and so, of course, we can as a 501c3 uh, nonprofit, and we cannot make any endorsements. Um, and with that being said, we can see that you are obviously knowledgeable about this issue and that um, you are a friend to patients out there. Uh, obviously. And so you're running. Uh, early voting has already started, and so it is not too late for people to get out there and make their decision, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the primaries here between you and your opponent who, who we all acknowledge has not been a friend to this program and you know while I hope none of us are single issue voters uh, for people who are sick or, or one of their loved ones is sick this is an important issue and we need people in government who can understand and and the complexities of this issue so I urge people to get out there and vote if you like if you like what you've heard here today uh, I would suggest you consider that in in your voting habits and if they and want to find out more about you is there a website they can go to or Absolutely. a facebook page or something Steve like that Ross dot Vegas, and Steve everybody Ross should have Vegas. a dot Vegas, uh, uh, have domain, name. domain name domain absolutely yeah, yeah. So Steve Ross dot Vegas, and you can find me there all day my cell number's there anything you want to know about me and I appreciate you guys having me on today I hope Thanks this helps so thank you for, for taking on. your we time we really sir. appreciate your time as well you bet thank you all right thank you we'll be right back Listening to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Now, here again, the Weekend. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. So, we just had Steve Ross in the uh, studio. That was a great, great little interview there. Fantastic. And uh, let's start with some local news. Uh, we just had the uh, Patient's, Patient's Choice, Choice Awards. in town uh, this last weekend. That was a great event. Weekend, we knocked it out of the park with the soaps and the socks. Uh, <laughs> made enough money to help probably about five or six patients, uh, patients' choice. So I didn't get a chance to really walk around and see the event because I was at the booth the whole time. But the people that were coming through, very, very good people. Where was it, and can you tell us a little bit more about what it was? Well, the patients' choice is a, a cannabis competition. Um, with like, like the High Times Cannabis Cups where mm. the, the, the growers enter their product and, and unlike other, like the cannabis cups and that where they have celebrity judges and all that and you don't really know who's winning, this was judged by the attendees. If you're in attendance, you could go stand in line to judge the flower or judge the concentrates. So mm. the, people, the people, the patrons were the judges. So that's why they call it the Patient's Choice Awards. Mm -hmm. And this was the second one. Um, it was put, in, put on by our good friends at the Clark County Cannabis Club. And um, it was held at a private residence because mm -hmm. that's the way we have to do it. Sure. You know, and, um, and everybody had to be a patient. And, mm -hmm. and there was quite a good turnout. I'd say there was probably, probably 500, 600 people there. Wow. Yeah. It was that a, many, huh? Yeah. It was a, it was a big, 
big private property. It was only half of the property that they used. That's how big it was. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was it was very well attended. Um, lots of lots of vendors there. Um, a lot of the vendors weren't local. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were from out of state and stuff. Well, what about the patients? Do you think that there were any out of state patients, or were they all? Local? Oh, I'm, I'm I'm sure there were out of state patients. I mean, a majority of our patients here are from California mm -hmm. and that. And we did have uh, some people tell me they traveled for it. Uh, you know, reason to come to Vegas. And it, yes, it, goes, it shows you know? how <laughs> how this industry can help the Las Vegas and Clark County economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's small at the start, even five, six hundred people for a, for a cannabis-based event in, in Las Vegas. That's huge. That's uh, good. You know, but compared to, to conventions or trade shows that come in, it's very, it's small, but it's just at the inception. And this, it can be such a growth industry in the state. I was just reading an article on my phone maybe 20, 20 30 minutes before the show started, and it was... Um, in the review journal online and it was all about how a lot of these california companies are starting to take a really hard look these california cannabis corporations mm -hmm. are taking a much harder look at nevada all of a sudden than they were let's say a couple of years ago when the after that initial fallout after the uh, original round of dispensary and cultivation permits mm -hmm. were issued in the county you remember that fateful day where the county where everyone was in there and it was that whole thing after that there was kind of a lull and now you're starting to see the interest pick back up so when you say oh well there's a lot of california vendors and things like that I would imagine that some of the more notable uh, California concentrate and edible companies and things like that are going to try to start making their mark here because you've already seen companies like Moxie and things like that, people from Colorado come in and try to license and brand their mm -hmm. stuff here in Nevada, and it's just going to continue to snowball as places reach out for more of those uh, established brand names to pick up on. I think that part of that is due to the fact that uh, we had this uh, round of licensing applications in 2014, and because of the delay in getting them done, the, the uh, Department, the Division of Health decided not to have that that open window in 2015, mm -hmm. but everything that I'm seeing so far indicates they are going to open that window uh, this year again. So those out-of-state companies are going to want to take advantage of that because there's a, a limited number of licenses that will be issued. So they, oh, wow. Well, I guess we'll uh, hopefully be breaking that story when it develops also, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. As soon as it does. Yeah. And uh, in other local news, um, the patient program. Mm -hmm. I I just recently received some disturbing news. Um, I went to, called about my packet because I expire in July. But you mean the the state medical marijuana pro, like if you're yeah. applying for a packet? Because yeah. I was thinking we were talking about our patient program. Yeah, our patient program. No, yes. I mean our weekend oh, no, patient yeah. program. My oh, fault. No, no, I, no, I, no, I, no I, the state was, program. Okay. So I'm due to renew in July, July okay. 19th. It's been my renewal date forever. Um, I called about my packet because I wanted to help another patient who has some anxiety. I wanted to go to the DMV with her and get everything done at the same time. They informed me when I, when I called them that, yes, that's fine. I've already sent my packet. I should be receiving it. But the day they receive it back becomes my new expiration date. Mm -hmm. So I received my packet last week. Now, normally, I'm always at the doctors helping with our weekend patient program. So I usually have my packet filled out and ready to go within a week, no problem, because I see the doctors every week anyway. So it's not out of my way to go. So I would have already sent that back. Mm -hmm. And not knowing this, I would have already sent that back, and I would have lost six weeks off of my packet from last year. And this that is you paid not for. something new. You know, it this, is, they just started doing this. Well, when when we were holding the the. Uh, cannabis uh, symposiums back in 2014, uh, I remember somebody coming up to me and talking about this exact issue that uh, that they got their card back and they were they were shorted about a month and a half, a month and three weeks from the full year. And, you know, if, if you go to a dispensary and you were shorted, uh, you know, uh, uh, an eighth or two off of your ounce, you'd be pretty mad. Oh, of course. But they're letting, the, uh, the patients so far have been letting the state get away with this well that so, was that was on the that was on the new 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 applications mm -hmm. then because it was taking they they started your new renewal date from when they received it but it'd be six or seven weeks until you actually got your card oh, okay. to purchase well see now they fixed that they've gone into a new computer program which now they're getting those out in nine days to two weeks on the new patients yeah okay? i've uh, talked now, to a couple of patients that you've of that, helped it's be, because of that program 
this is what they say. They said it's because of that program that the renewal date changes when you get the packet. So now instead of new patients losing six weeks on the beginning of their first application, everybody who renews is going to lose time on the back end of their application. Right, and probably so every happy. year henceforth. Yes. So yeah, what, over the course year. of eight or nine years, Unless the state, will, you'll roll it back an entire year and they'll be making more money off the licensing. Is that yeah. what this is about? Ultimately, well, I don't think it's about that. I think it's just... Um, inefficiencies in the state process and they need to get this programming error corrected. It almost seems malicious in nature. I don't want to say it that I way, wanna, but I would just, they're just, uh, I it's just know. always something it seems like. I, I, I found from personal experience that when you characterize the government as malicious, they prove you right. So, <laughs> so I, I don't want to do that. Fair uh, enough. You know, uh, but I, I think this is one of those things that, that we can and our supporters are going to have to um, get with the Division of Health and, and force these changes. Uh, this is something that we can has been doing since the start of, of this nonprofit, uh, going out there, speaking truth to power, getting in front of, of legislators or local uh, government officials and, and the division as well. So um, no, I don't think there's any maliciousness here. I, I think it's just, you know, typical inefficiencies. Just honest that mistakes happen. that are rolling down upon the packs of the patients. I, I'd, I'd prefer to, to look at it that way. Okay. Um, so, but it's something that, that we all need to, uh, to be aware of. And so if our listeners, uh, as patients, get their license back and they're shorted four weeks or six weeks, they ought to call up and complain. And mm -hmm. not that that individual call is going to get things done immediately, but the weight of enough calls. If we can mobilize our various members uh, and followers, then uh, we're going to get this change accomplished for the betterment of all patients in the state. Yeah, and, the, and it was the phone calls that prompted them to tell me that because they've already been receiving those phone calls. When people get their card, their new card in the mail, they're like, wait, my expiration date is wrong. And so they call and say, what the heck happened? You, know. you, you had sure. a really terrific idea, Kurt, uh, when we were having private discussion uh, uh, some days ago uh, in that uh, after the first year, uh, your expiration date should be tied to your birthday, just like your driver's license is. So it makes it easy for everybody. You don't have to worry, figure, you know, it's not, what's my anniversary date? Uh, I don't remember. And if it's tied to your birthday, especially if you're going down to the, uh, the DMV every four years and getting your license, well, why not combine this with with that. So I, I think that's a, another direction that we could hopefully uh, convince the state to take a look that at. It seems reasonable. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy with the date I've, I've had forever. It's real easy to remember, you know. It, it falls, it, it actually falls right in line with our anniversary date for weekend. So it makes it real easy. We're, you know, July 20th is our, is our anniversary mark, and July 19th is when I got my card. So wow. I got my card and became a weekend member the very next day. There you go. <laughs> so. There you go. So uh, also in the state of Nevada, we see that the Nevada Supreme Court is going to be reviewing a proposed comment to be added to the state rules of pro professional conduct for lawyers. Wow, professional conduct for lawyers? That's amazing. Um, uh, relating to the state's medical marijuana laws, and they'll be holding this at 1 p.m. on July 7th here in Las Vegas, uh, the, and it'll be video conferenced up to uh, the Nevada Supreme Court in Carson City. And what they're doing is they want to have comment from attorneys and the public regarding the proposed comment and whether additional changes to the state rules are required. And, and what happened was in 2014, the Supreme Court added a comment to the rules that allowed uh, allowing Nevada attorneys to counsel clients regarding medical marijuana decisions. And I'm not talking about criminal cases here with defendants. I'm talking about people who were running MMEs, or becoming licensees. Mm -hmm. uh, the new comment seeks to inform attorneys that federal law prohibits the sale, use, or possession of marijuana as if someone could pass the bar without knowing that, uh, you know, and, and that engaging in such behavior, even where allowed by state law, could result in prosecution and the threat of attorney misconduct. So what, what the Supreme Court is looking to do is make it clear to attorneys that if they're taking MMEs on as clients, that they could be sanctioned by the courts, either on a state or a federal level, hmm. um, for providing counsel to these people. And it's just another way that if, if, this, uh, if this change does get written into, the, uh, uh, into their rules, it, it just shows a, another way that the bureaucracy can throw sand into the gears and slow things down. 
you know, if, if this is a state legal business and you've got attorneys acting in a lawful manner in the state, then why should the state start threatening them with sanctions? Well, um, yeah, and another thing, uh, attorneys are licensed by the state, not by the federal government. So mm -hmm. what, what does anything with the federal government have it's to like do It's like Mike that? said, it's just a They're, way for them to throw sand in the gears. It's a way for them to slow down the process a little bit because people in certain places I feel like don't want this program to exist and they're going to do what they can to to slow it down. I mean, you can say, oh, well, we just want to make sure it's done right, or this, that, and the other, but really there haven't been many, if any, negative in in uh, incidents to point to with the legal MME licensed dispensaries. So this is just, I don't know, I don't want to say fabricated, but uh, proactive in nature purely. And I just don't know, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the game plan is. Are they afraid the state's going to get sued by the federal government or something? Um, no, I don't think they're afraid of that at all. Uh, I, I think it just becomes a case where there, uh, there are some people in there uh, who just uh, think that they don't believe the, the, the anecdotal evidence from, from lots of people's research. They don't believe the, the actual research that's been done in other countries. They, they're still looking this, at this as a social evil and what they can do to delay it. I, I remember uh, just a um, couple of months ago, uh, I, I was at a hearing of uh, the Interim Legislative Council and uh, uh, Nevada Supreme Court Justice Hardesty was presiding over this and he was asking uh, the people at the Divi Division of Health whether there had been complaints from any people in the state uh, that the edibles were causing them to hallucinate. And so, you know, it, to me, that, that showed that he doesn't really have a good grasp on what this medicine does. And so you have people like that who are, uh, who are doing everything they can to slow down the wheels of progress. They're the people who believe so in... So what is, uh, I mean, th this is kind of out of the hands of the average citizen, isn't it? This is kind of a, a fight between the legal minds of the powers that be? Most likely. I, I don't think they're going to pay a whole lot of attention to, uh, to what the citizens say unless we get up there en masse and, and, you know, have 50 people show up and each person take three minutes and then, you know, we, we delay them by three hours. <laughs> they, they, then they might start to listen. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to look at, at one, one other thing here before we go to break. There's an international study that says recreational marijuana prohibition violates human rights and this comes from uh, Duke London written by uh, at marijuana.com and he's on, on Monday May 30th legal scholars from Rabud University uh, University in the Netherlands re uh, released the international law and cannabis 2 study their findings uh, from a lengthy study on how certain human rights obligations are affected by widespread widespread cannabis legislation and you know they're arguing that this prohibition uh, just violates the most basic of human rights and we actually see in Mexico just a few months ago their Supreme Court came out with this very decision and it, it has decriminalized uh, personal use of, of drugs uh, because they feel that the government does not have the authority to go in there and and micromanage people's lives that way and what they're what they're saying the primary conditions set in this study uh, for the regulation and trade of recreational cannabis are uh, num uh, there are five points the first is relevant human rights based interests uh, where they conclude that uh, the regulation of recreational marijuana would be considered a positive obligation for human rights based on our right to health and life uh, our right to not be subjected to inhumane treatment and our right to privacy and that inhumane treatment is is imprisoning people and even if you put people in in a nice prison which I, I have yet to uh, see um, you're still it's inhumane to put them in prison for treating themselves medically or just for doing something to to make them feel good feel better in life which as long as they're not hurting anybody else. And, uh, you know, the second point is that, that and, and jump in on any of these. No, it's right. just like we've made these arguments over and over. It's just the amount of incarcerated people for these nonviolent crimes in this country is just completely outrageous. I look at, when I was a little kid, I remember people used to say, this is the freest country in the world, and people would, like, be proud of it and really mean it. And when you say that today, just people kind of laugh. They're like, yeah, sure. 
sure freest country in the world it's like a, it's like a joke and it's so sad how quickly that social uh, perception has mm -hmm. just devolved in society and people are so status they're just like if the government says it's bad it's bad we hate the dope we hate the dopers. The law is the law. Follow the law because it's the law. And that's their justification is follow the law because it's the law. And yet at the same time, we have historically low approval ratings in Congress. And we have an election this year where on the Republican side, you've got one of the most anti-politicians ever. And on the Democratic side, you've got a, you know, a, a far left progressive Democratic socialist uh, who has been capturing the youth vote with over 80 percent oh and, yeah and so uh, the bernie or bust people the democrats mm -hmm. are scared about that because they feel like those people aren't going to show up and that's a whole nother issue well, the odds um, are they won't because younger crazy. voters don't don't tend to vote as much but the point there being you're saying well, on the one hand people listen to this you know government prohibition hardline at the same time most of them don't trust the government with anything else so why do they believe this i don't know i, I don't know I think the younger voters are coming out because they are anti-establishment and they're just fed up with it. I mean, he's pulling, Bernie's pulling numbers that rock bands would love to pull. He's filling, mm. he's filling <laughs> stadiums that bands can't fill. He filled you know? 60,000 seats <laughs> the yeah. other day. Yeah. And, and he's not going to be the Democratic nominee. It's just, well, it's just that simple at this point. They had that decided yeah. before he even got into the race. I, so. yes, <laughs> I, I, cer I certainly th I think so. Uh, but back to this human rights uh, mm. study, they say that the second point is that the claim of a more effective human rights protection must be substantiated and says that each country is different and the study should, their study should not be interpreted as a blanket solution but rather a guide to reform and legal scholars suggest that each country participate in research and pilot programs to determine uh, if the legalization of recreational cannabis rather than prohibition would pr protect its citizens rights or harm them and I, I've got another story here that shows from 2002 to 2013 that teen marijuana use has dropped by 10 percent <laughs> and and that's showing that as we regulate this as more legitimate markets come online that it is not the forbidden fruit that it was previously. And this is in the face of recreational, this is in the face of more access, in the face of endless cannabis related products coming in the market between edibles and the rise of concentrates, dabs and things like that, vaporizer mm -hmm. pens, like it's, the game has changed so much and there is so much more variety for people out there and yet still these teen use rates fall. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and, you know, a third point in this is national democratic support and decision making, which basically says that a country should not ignore the will of its people. And here in the United States, recent polls uh, are showing that uh, a majority of 54% of Americans favor legalization taxation regulation across the board and so this is saying it is a violation of human rights for um, for governments to enact a tyranny of the minority and and force these prohibitions on their citizens who largely are looking to liberalize these laws uh, and, uh, and uh, we can come back to this, but we probably right. need a break. It's time for our second break. Uh, make sure you check out our sponsors. These are the people that help make our show happen. And uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. So we were talking about um, this, this human rights study that's come out and you know five points and we'll just touch on these last couple quickly before we get into other things uh, and what they're saying is that you know if countries are dissimilar uh, and have different um, different degrees of, of, uh, of cannabis laws that uh, as long what they should do is is enact a complete closed system within a country so you have uh, cultivation you have productions you have your extractions you have your your distribution and retail all within the country so so that way if the United States doesn't want to let Mexican pot across the border because Texas uh, or, or other states still are, are opposed to it then that's fine but each country should be allowed its sovereignty to develop its own cannabis laws rather than relying on the UN single convention on narcotics which was passed in 1961 which is seriously out of date and whose head is a, a Russian uh, politician who who has been deadly against this and has blocked 
any sort of um, yeah. uh, any any sort of change. That uh, guy went with the military into Siberia, and they were trying to eradicate all the wild cannabis, and spent like like billions of rubles trying to go for it, and ended up just giving it up because it's just it's everywhere. They couldn't. You know, they, they, they couldn't do it, and, and it's just one of those things. And we do the same thing here. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars annually in the Midwest having having police teams rip up ditch weed on the side of the road. Weed that, that was originally, those, those seeds came from the government during the Hemp for Victory campaign in World War II when mm -hmm. we needed hemp after we lost the Philippines. And, you know, this stuff just seeded out, went wild, and, and so we are wasting all of this money and law enforcement resources on um, on eradicating something they won't even get anybody high to begin it's with. just hemp yeah it's it's just hemp huh. uh, you know and the the fifth point and I, and I think that this is an important one the obligatory policy of discouragement and what it meaning that countries uh, who do not allow recreation loot use which is uh, everybody but um, uh, I guess the Europe. Netherlands Portugal and Uruguay yeah, yeah. Um, and and now uh, Mexico on, on a very small personal level um, you know that these countries should not officially be lying to their people and putting this propaganda for for 40 plus years we've had a war on drugs fostered by a DEA which has now grown to 11,000 people strong it's a shadow state department and they they have untold amounts of money and there's a, an office in the in the presidential administration uh, called the uh, office of national drug control policy and by their very mandate uh, the rules under which that agency operates they are are not allowed to say anything positive about reform or legalization or or diminution of, of penalties or anything like that. They're just and they're there allowed to, to lie when necessary. They're and when necessary is any time they don't agree with something somebody is saying. It's just crazy. So so there's a very interesting study and, and I think it's very valid for a lot of people. And once again, uh, that came uh, from the site marijuana.com and you can just go up and it's on their front page uh, today and probably will Well, be so what does this week. mean? They say the world courts in the Netherlands, right? So does this have any repercussions through that? I mean, I can't imagine marijuana related you know, case going to the world court, but what it does it have any effect on that whatsoever? I, does this I, no, I don't think tie it does into anything? It, it, it's a university study, so it's not going to be something that is going to carry legal weight. It's it's more of a an, an informative and, and educational point to to get this discussion moving forward and to hopefully get action from that. But uh, what they're you know one of the things that that they're talking about uh, here is that. You have governments that are uh, that are divided within themselves, and you know we I just mentioned the DEA, mm -hmm. and the DEA uh, has been using this single convention from 1961 for for decades now to prevent research into cannabis, and they maintain this one one farm at the University of Mississippi. Mississippi down in Biloxi where where they have this um, uh, this terrible low quality weed being produced so and, I've heard and yeah and I, I've met one stems. of the people on the who's still on the federal uh, medical marijuana program and and she says that they they send her you know 300 grams every month and she no, doesn't use it or she uses it for cooking because it is so terrible and the DEA has been saying that due to the the this UN treaty that we cannot have more than one source of of marijuana being grown in the country for study but just in the past couple of months the United States State Department said that the, the D, DEA is wrong on this and that yes we certainly can multiply source cannabis for um, for research and that the the DEA has just been blowing smoke up everybody's butt for all these seizing years. a lot of power for itself over the over Absolutely. the years as a uh, started as a very small government entity and has grown by leaps and bounds without like by its own by its own mandate you know they they take it for themselves as they perceive the the problems growing and i'm not going to get on another rant about the the dea because i found that doing that in the past is one of the surest ways to get yourself raided so you know i'll, I'll <laughs> limit uh, uh I'll, I'll limit my criticism here but wow we have to be more involved in the country that we're living in and involved in the direction that it's going and that means registering that means going out to vote and a lot of people find that to be 
an obligation, but but we here over the past few years have have learned that going before the legislature, going before local commissions, and speaking to politicians directly is the only thing that's going to change their minds and and move it forward. And so you know, I, as I've often said, people should really be involved in this issue because the arrest you prevent may be your own. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, well, we got a little bit of time left. Uh, we we're talking about some studies uh, last week. A study came out from AAA mm -hmm. saying that the legal limits for driving are, uh, on pot are not backed oh, by science. Oh, how long have we been banging that drum? Yeah, oh exactly. my god. Right. Gee, for the last three legislative sessions we've yeah. been asking for them to raise the uh, de facto nanogram well, limit. Remove it. You know, we're one of only six states that has a nanogram limit. The, so, the other, the other uh, 44 states out there see, don't have a limit. And the it's argument a, it's a against per se limit. It means if, if they find it in your system they don't care whether you smoked four minutes ago or four weeks ago. If they find it in your system, you're de facto guilty. Yeah, you're automatic DUI. Um, the argument against that, I was talking to one of the female Republican senators last legislative session when me and Jen were up in Carson trying to kind of chew through this. Mm -hmm. uh, some assembly bill was proposed that got some language slipped in that I we were going to try to take advantage of. I forgot which one, but the long and the short of it, the female senator basically said that she didn't have enough confidence or we shouldn't have that she didn't put that she said we probably should not put all of that faith into the individual police officer's hands which is where the power would then reside to determine intoxication it would be their perception of whether you are or you aren't if the de facto limits were taken away and there's nothing on paper to back you up and she's like look a lot of these younger police officers can't even tell the difference between someone who's having a diabetic episode and someone who's drunk they tase people having dry diabetic so episodes. so do you it's really incredible. want your freedom at their hands how do you think they'll treat you and the the and my thought was well hell they're gonna throw you under the bus every time they get a chance to was the my automatic thought so how do we work through that even if we got them all the levels removed how would we chew through that problem there well there, there are several points there and one of them is that under nevada law when by getting a driver's license you are granting the police the ability to draw your blood anytime that they think forcibly that you're into forcibly draw your blood anytime they think you're intoxicated and that is a trade-off you make for riding on nevada roads so even you know if, if whether the police think you're intoxicated or not uh in this scenario uh they could draw blood from you uh, and if it comes back and you're over that two nanogram limit you, you're you're hit with a dui yet the other point of that the that you made is giving the officer too much power and uh, field sobriety tests. I've been advised by multiple lawyers that, well, I don't drink and drive. That, that's that's number one. But right. but if you get pulled over and the officer wants to conduct a field sobriety test, stand up for your rights and say no. Because as soon as you agree to that sobriety test, you have failed it because it is subjective and the officer can do whatever or say whatever and as they and so often do he says you know he thinks you're under the influence and that you're jammed up there and so uh anytime somebody's pulled over you should just uh assert your rights there and say no and he may say well i'm going to go draw blood you know but and then you have to make the decision yourself how to proceed forth but um you're right giving the individual officer that kind of control is problematic but so is a law that doesn't account for the fact that medical patients not only are going to have a much higher uh, nanogram level in their system, but that they tolerate the medication. Oh, you know? absolutely. I heard someone say it a long time ago. I forgot who was talking to me about this, but they made an argument. They said, look, a fresh cannabis user will, of course, be more intoxicated mm -hmm. than an experienced one. Similar to, this is a very extreme level, but if you've ever done dip, tobacco dip, mm -hmm and you take it for the first time, it gets you really high. The nicotine is almost overwhelming, and almost to the point to where people throw up. If you were to jump in a car right at that exact moment, you probably wouldn't be in such a good such a good place. Should we test people for de facto nicotine levels? Of course not, because it breaks into your system so quick that it's socially accepted. Now, I'm not saying it's the same for weed because it isn't. The break-in time is longer, but there is a break-in time, and you're, the, the tolerance goes up rather quickly. 
And you know, yeah, and you mentioned an interesting point because with tobacco, uh, back in the 1600s, when tobacco was first being brought from the New World back to the European colonies, mm -hmm. there are there are writings from religious leaders extolling against the use of tobacco because it was getting people intoxicated, and that it was the effect was so strong on these people that uh, that they felt that you know it it had to be banned. And you know, over years, over centuries now. Uh, you've got tobacco use, which is normalized, and you know, yes, it 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 kills people, yeah. but it doesn't get them as high. Uh, and I don't smoke cigarettes, uh, but we, you know, uh, I, I hear people who do get a little jolt. I think we're out of time. Yeah, we got to. We're running out of time, so uh, yeah, be sure uh, check us out. We'll be at first Friday uh, tomorrow, June third. Uh, Las Vegas Hemp Fest on Saturday all day. Come Can't out, wait. check out our booth. Come out, get your socks and your soaps. And uh, besides that, uh, we have uh, Elevate Magazine next Thursday, so we'll get, cover that a little more on the next show. And thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week.